think quite clearly. It's a case of injustice from Massachusetts, which has royal civil society and public opinion in New England, and it's known as deflate gate. It has, as I said, nothing to do uh, with treaty arbitration. The facts are these. On the, 20, on the 18th of January 2015, the New England Patriots won the American Football Conference Championships against the Indianapolis Colts at their home stadium in New England. Important, New England in winter is very, very cold. Now that qualified the prayer Patriots to play the 2015 Super Bowl, which the Patriots were later to win against the Seattle Seahawks. During the earlier championship game against the Colts, a Colts linebacker had intercepted a pass thrown by the Patriots quarterback, Tom Brady. You may have heard last night that he endorsed Mr. Trump. That was apparently a complete lie. He had not and does not endorse Mr. Trump. So he's still a good person. <laughs> now, the Colts ground staff who recovered the football noticed that it felt under impressive, thereby making it easier for Tom Brady as a quarterback to hold and throw. And after the game, inevitably, the allegation was made that the Patriots had deliberately, with Tom Brady's knowledge, deflated the ball to a pressure below the permitted range of 12.5 PSI. The National Football League then became an, be, began an investigation into a possible violation of their rules. Four months later, in May 2015, the NFL published an investigator's report, the so-called Wells Report, which ran to some 140 pages. The investigator found having interviewed all relevant personnel, that, and I quote, it is more probable than not that New England Patriots personnel participated in violations of the playing rules and were involved in a deliberate effort to circumvent the rules. And also that Tom Brady had been, and I quote, at least generally aware, unquote, of this deliberate circumvention. A week later, the NFL announced that it would find the Patriots a million dollars and subjected them to certain administrative punishments. The NFL also announced that Tom Brady, the quarterback, would be suspended without pay for the first four games of the 2015 season. Tom Brady appealed. The NFL decided that the appeal would be decided as an arbitrator, namely its own commissioner, a man called Roger Goodell. Brady complained at the commissioner's lack of neutrality, but that complaint was rejected. It was then a normal hearing before the sole arbitrator. Thank you very much, thanks. With Tom Brady denying on oath that he knew or approved of any attempt to deflate any game ball. And on the 28th of July 2015, the solar arbitrator issued his award, rejecting Tom Brady's appeal and confirming his punishment. Now, the award stated that the evidence fully supported the allegation that Brady had taken part in a scheme to tamper with the game balls and had also willfully obstructed the investigation by arranging for his cell phone to be destroyed after he had purchased a new phone. The case then goes to court. In the US Federal Court for the Southern District of New York, the federal judge gave judgment against the NFL, vacated the award, and annulled Tom Brady's punishment. There is then, therefore, an appeal. In April 2016, the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, by a majority, with a strong dissent, allowed the appeal, quashed the federal judge's judgment, upheld the award, and reinstated Tom Brady's punishment. Further attempts by Tom Brady for a rehearing or an appeal to the US Supreme Court were not successful. And so beginning this year, the 2016 season, Tom Brady duly served out his punishment. Now the merits of the case are complicated, but one of the issues was a crucial scientific issue concerning the ideal gas law. For those of you who studied physics in school long ago, you may remember what it says. As the temperature of a fixed volume vessel such as a football is reduced, the average velocity of the molecules inside the vessel decreases, resulting in a proportional decrease in the magnitude of the force that the molecules of gas exert on the walls of the vessel. Hence, air pressure in a football will drop naturally when taken from a warm, warm locker room inside a football stadium to a very cold playing field outside the stadium 
in winter as it was in England, in New England, in January 2015. Thus the scientific issue, and it was a crucial issue, was not whether the ball had deflated during the game, it clearly had, under the ideal gas law, but rather whether the full extent of that deflation could be explained by natural factors. Now before the Court of Appeal, 21 professors of physics, including 10 professors at MIT, testified to the appellate court as amici that it was readily explainable and that there was absolutely no scientific proof of tampering. Now, of course, you can't get better than that. You could have 22 professors and maybe 11 MIT professors, but that's a fairly good start. Now, the appellate court's majority, with its deference to arbitration awards, and especially labor awards, was not interested in the scientific or any other merits of the case. It held that it was not the court's role to determine for ourselves whether Brady participated in a scheme to deflate footballs. The court's role was limited to determining whether the arbitration proceedings and the arbitrator's award met the minimum legal standards, and those standards were, according to the majority, did not require perfection. Rather, they dictate that even if an arbitrator makes mistakes of fact or law, we may not disturb an award so long as he acted within the bounds of his bargain for authority. In other words, within his or her jurisdiction. Now, there was another amici brief to the appellate court by an experienced and well-known arbitrator in the USA, <coughs> Kenneth Feinberg. And he supported Tom Brady's case on the very simple proposition that if the flawed arbitration award was not vacated by the US courts, in his words, it will fundamentally erode the public's trust and confidence in arbitration. And so it has, at least in New England. Would it have been so if there had been a genuine appeal on the facts? including the scientific application of the laws of physics. Even for arbitration specialists in the United States, there is unease at the extreme deference paid by the appellate court to award to arbitration awards said to be so scientifically flawed. It was an important case for Tom Brady personally, and it was a devastating case both for him and the New England Patriots in the long term. Tom Brady will be treated by many as a cheat, a liar, and a perjurer, for the rest of his life. And outside New England, few considered the Patriots deserved to have won the 2015 Super Bowl. Now, Tom Brady is, of course, a very wealthy man, and the loss of four months' wages may not hurt him significantly. But what if he'd be banned for the rest of his playing career, or even lost his job at the Patriots? To many, there is an unacceptable risk in the unbridled exercise of too much arbitral power. As a matter of basic justice, so it is said, there is a strong case for a right to appeal on both the factual and legal merits of a devastating arbitration award. If we take the Lowen Award, the first award under NAFTA involving the United States, and I'll come back to it later, as a case where the injustice of the case still rankles for many, apart, of course, from the successful party, would that have case have benefited from an, an appeal on the factual merits to an international appellate court or tribunal? And the success of ICS has, uh, has added many examples. And such awards include not only damages for huge sums, whether it be the UCOS ECT awards or the CME Stockholm award, but also game-changing decisions such as Mazzettini on MFN clauses, Salini and MHS on the definition of an investment, and Abitrat on mass claims by bondholders. Now, in our own national legal system, we would not tolerate the absence of such a check or control in any system of national courts. So the question arises, should it be left to one tribunal, be it a sole arbitrator or three arbitrators, or a single judge or three, to decide the fate of millions, and for those decisions to be accorded such deference on the merits as would make even Pontius Pilate blush? The answer for arbitration, I regret to say, is probably yes, as regards appeals on facts including scientific facts. And for that, we have to go back to look at history's failures in this respect. If you go to the 1965 ICSID Convention, there was nothing there about an international <coughs> investment appellate court, or at least nothing that I found in the travaux for that convention. The model for resolving investor state disputes was assumed to be international arbitration, taken both from the historical use of arbitration in concession agreements between concessionaires and states, and also from disputes between states, much influenced by the Alabama arbitration 
on the example of the PCA and the Hague Conventions. These arbitration models did not include any system of appeal for errors of law or fact on the merits. The 1965 ICSID Convention also did not, apply, did not provide for any appeal uh, on any form, on, on, sorry, any appeal on the merits from an ICSID award, and its ad hoc annulment committees enjoyed, as is now been understood, only a very limited review, falling far, far short of an appeal for errors of law or fact. The earlier 1958 New York Convention had said nothing at all about any appellate mechanism giving the recognition and enforcement of convention awards to state courts. In 1995, at the LCI Centenary Conference in London, Judge Schwebel, then a judge of the ICJ, and Judge Howard Holtzman, then a judge of the Iran US Claims Tribunal, suggested that an international court should be established at The Hague to decide challenges on a worldwide basis to New York Convention awards, replacing national courts. Professor Hans van Hutter, now the presiding judge of the Iran US Claims Tribunal, cautiously welcomed the idea at the time with the warning, using an IT in French, not Flemish, la politique et l'art du possible. Therefore, Professor Van Hutter preferred the idea of an additional protocol to the New York Convention by its contracting states, whereby states agreed to submit disputes concerning its interpretation and application to an existing international court, namely the ICJ, and not a new court. Now, this proposal mirrored a special jurisdiction exercised by the ICJ in regard to disputed arbitration awards <coughs> made between states. There were two such cases decided by the ICJ. The 1960 case concerning the arbitration award made by the King of Spain in 1906, but then affecting Honduras and Nicaragua. And secondly, the 1991 case concerning the arbitration award between Senegal and Guinea-Bissau. That jurisdiction can only be exercised by consent. The ICJ has no general or inherent jurisdiction to adjudicate upon the validity of an award between states, and of course still less between a state and a non-state party. I'm going to stick part of this history and just jump to 1958, because in 1958 we had the ILC's model rules on arbitral procedure, where in Article 36.1 there was an attempt to give a default jurisdiction to the ICJ if within three months of the date on which the validity of the award is contested, the parties have not agreed on another tribunal, the ICJ shall be competent to declare the total or partial nullity of the award on the application of either party. Now these proposals, uh, unfortunately, went nowhere, save as regards the two cases that I have mentioned, which depended upon the ad hoc consent in those two cases to the ICJ's jurisdiction. And even today, the IC, ICJ's jurisdiction on awards must be established ad hoc by special agreement or submission. Now, so much for the basis of the ICJ's jurisdiction, but what about the scope or extent of that jurisdiction? That was discussed by the ICJ in the guinea bissau and Senegal case in 1991, where it repeated its earlier explanation of, uh, of 1960 in Honduras and Nicaragua. And I'll read paragraph 25. In this respect, the court would emphasize that as the parties were both agreed, these proceedings alleged the inexistence and nullity of the award rendered by the arbitration tribunal and are not by way of appeal from it or application for revision of it. As the court had occasion to observe with respect, and then it referred to the earlier case, the award is not subject to appeal and the court cannot approach the consideration of the objections raised by Nicaragua to the validity of the award as a court of appeal. The court is not called upon to pronounce on whether the arbitrator's decision was right or wrong. These and cognate considerations have no relevance to the function of the court. It's called upon to discharge in these proceedings, which is to decide whether the award is proved to be a nullity, having no effect. And so the ICJ decided that its role was limited to ascertaining whether by rendering the disputed award the tribunal acted in manifest 
breach of the competence conferred on it by the Arbitration 